uh, hello, Paul. Uh, Raka is with us today for a uh, recording on US presidential elections. I understand that you are uh, busy traveling in Bangkok, but I thought we will uh, have a quick discussion on this. There are quite a few contradictory views coming from so-called experts. So uh, it will be interesting to know your views as well. Uh, to begin with, Raga, can you please talk about this article which came through our team uh, and also introduce us to the author? Sure, Parker. So um, the US elections are coming up towards the later part of the year. And uh, we chanced upon this article titled, Pick a Side and Fight for It, Keep Your Head Down or Flee. It was published on LinkedIn on June 26th by the author Ray Dalio. To give a little bit of a brief on Ray Dalio, he is an American investor. He is a hedge fund, hedge fund manager and the founder of the world's biggest hedge fund firm, uh, Bridgewater Associates, which manages about $124 billion. Um, he stepped out. He stepped down as CEO in 2017, and he has retired as a co-chief information officer in 2022. Um, so that's his basic profile in terms of his background. And this particular article talks about the US elections um, where there is an increasing move towards civil war and extremism because of the hardening of both the left and the right. He says that we are at a stage where in the US, you see the left wing and the right wing becoming more extreme, and he calls it the hardening process. And he talks about how there's a wealth gap in the system between the haves and have nots, which increases this particular risk of civil war. And he talks about how the media kind of plays a role into this particular polarization and kind of feeds into the divisiveness of the political environment right now. He says that um, if Biden wins, uh, the, the supporters of Trump may not accept it easily. And conversely, if Trump wins, Biden supporters may not accept it. And he predicts that there is a potentially higher than 50% chance that uh, democracy will not run smoothly through the election and beyond. And he says that eventually it comes down to how individuals will have to face choices between picking a side to fight, keep their head down, or flee. And interestingly enough, he also talks about the vanishing middle ground in the US. He says that over the years, uh, there's been an increasing polarization, uh, narrative discourse, which kind of makes the centrists, the moderates, a disappearing um, group of people because their opinions are no longer considered. They are sidelined today in the political discourse and the rise of populism has led to that kind of divisiveness where people are forced to a corner to take a particular position. So yeah, that's, that's a brief of the article. So, Raka, it's interesting what he brings into picture. Keeping the so-called polarization in focus, uh, how would you characterize the current state of affairs as far as the elections later this year is concerned? The political polarization has been an issue ever since Trump came into picture, uh, even during Obama era. So uh, how how do you characterize the, uh, this year's election? Well, um, when it comes to you know Trump being... Um, part of the process, I think he is a symptom of the larger issue in American politics. Perhaps the pol polarization started even before Trump even came in and we didn't pick up on the particular trends. I think it was even during the Obama years that we did see some rise of radical uh, discourse, but that was largely ignored. Um, so as of now, there is a lot of uh, discontent with the two candidates. Um, there's a lot of disillusionment because there was a recent uh, U.S. presidential election where uh, President Joe Biden's performance was um, criticized heavily, even by the left wing. You see uh, the New York Times coming out saying that, uh, you know, President Biden needs to quit or give up. And that's saying a lot when the New York Times actually comes out against a Democratic president itself. So um, right now, there is a 
there, there's kind of a panic mode within the democratic side because a lot of insiders itself are calling down on calling for Joe Biden's resignation. And on the other side, you see uh, President Trump, who is con going through these hearings and uh, he's potentially looking at some serious charges for various uh, allegations. So this kind of environment puts people into a corner where they're forced to choose between two candidates who have some questionable um, qualifications for this role. And people are forced to that left or right bracket right now. So that has caused a lot of division within the society and the political sphere. Well, it is true that the political bitterness is at, at its highest. Um, in fact, this is probably uh, the worst years as far as the political bonhomie is concerned. We do not see the Bush senior and Clinton bonhomie anymore. But uh, if we look at the realities on the ground, especially the factors what you mentioned, the income inequality, the worst years were probably the Great Recession of 2007 and eight. Uh, and there were talk of civil war back then as well. I still remember speaking to quite a few Americans back then who were traveling in India that they were talking of the nation being at the brink of civil war, primarily because the income inequality is at its worst. Now, the same narrative is being pushed using the very same factors. Now, at, at the ground level, there, there are quite a few factors which are being ignored. The primary one at that is the power balance between the states as well as the federal authority. U.S. is a federal entity and the power balance is very much a major factor whenever we talk of such extreme uh, swing in terms of civil war or even political polarization. And the states are almost evenly divided. And in fact, quite a few are uh, divided in the in the middle. And that makes this all talk of uh, fundamentalist uh, civil war narrative uh, quite questionable, actually. Paul, your take? Oh, look, um, it's interesting. Um, firstly, obviously, you know, a, a brilliant investor was Ray Dalio, but he's retired. He's from New York. He's in her mid-70s. You don't become the largest hedge fund uh, without being in the know. If America, if you're an insider, you're a clever part of the establishment um, and, 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 a, and a part of the elitist cliques. But if they're writing laws for other countries to abide by, then it's nepotism and collusion. Um, Ray Dalio, obviously coming from New York, he is retired. He comes, they, the article was an interesting read. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have read it, except it did come from Mike Mangan, who's both a brilliant financial analyst and a brilliant military analyst. But I think a lot of his points are very moot points. So he's drawing back and looking at the, you know, what, what civil wars started that were right wing, what were the left shifting to the right. And the, the rest of the article is interesting in the fact that it's points towards civil war. And he talks about indicators. I, I agree with you. They're not indicators. They're their opinion. There's a thousand stronger opinions to argue there's going to be social unrest and there's going to be some civil unrest leading up to the elections and probably after because um, the red and the blue don't want to follow each other's camp. But there's a lot of other, other divisive issues in America um, with the haves, the have-nots, the elitist education, you know, intercultural issues, um, and it ignores all that. What was particularly frightening for me is it, it, it doesn't actually mention America or America's place globally. It doesn't actually look at their losing credibility. It doesn't look at, yes, at the moment, they're a the safe haven currency. Um, that may go down. So I don't think it was Ray Dalio's finest piece of analytical work he's ever done. I, I can't see America heading into a civil war scenario. I think it's it's like all these issues the media get on a bandwagon and start talking about and a journalist writes something interesting and everyone passes comment on it. I can't see it going down that path for some of the reasons you both mentioned. Um, I think, you know, if we look at the election debate, everyone's getting hung up on Biden's lack of performance, and that was no surprise. It's clear that he's got mental health issues in terms of emerging dementia. 
the Democrats obviously elected the best chance of winning the election was to run with him the name the people that he had beaten Trump. No one's focusing on the other side of that debate, and that is Trump was lying every 90 seconds. That's almost uh, people in America and, in fact, the Western world have been desensitized to politicians lying. It doesn't seem to be an issue anymore. It's more like expected. But I think the whole point of everybody on both sides attacking Biden is significant for two reasons. One, nothing's about policy or the people. It's all about an individual, whether you're trying to destroy them or whether you're trying to get them to win the election for you. And the other point to note is, you know, in, in Biden being very weak, he's still running the world's largest country. So who's really pulling the strings? If he's mentally in, in compass medicine, it's clear that he is. Um, that in itself says, well, does the president have too much power? And people are using the president's power for the allies and the five eyes and NATO to go to war for you know reasons other than what they declare. At what point are the powers of going to war without the people of the nation choosing to do so going to come? So I think the only point that Dahlia uh, makes that could be apt is that America needs a reset, and you know perhaps a lot of the societies worked out the only way they're going to have a reset and get away from the country being run by elitists for themselves and politicians not being accountable and politicians all uh, accumulating massive wealth. The only way that that's going to be overcome is by some kind of civil unrest and uprising, and I think that's more fanciful than real at this stage. I think this civil war, it's not on the... No, it's not a tangible thing on the horizon. And talking about indicators like Dalio does in his article is um, a very poor use of the term indicators and they're not defined or balanced against, you know, stronger indicators that indicate the opposite is going, is more likely to occur. And that's, you know, ongoing status quo with some escalating civil unrest bug of I must agree, Paul. In fact, I do not see a civil war on the horizon. However, uh, there are certain elements that he talks of which are quite credible. And as you rightly said, this may lead to civil unrest. And most important part of that uh, would be the populist tendencies, uh, which we saw ever since Trump came into picture. Uh, it began with yes. the migration issue. Especially, yes. with the, uh, especially with the uh, American, the Mexican Americans, and the Latino crowd coming into the U.S. Uh, yes. At the same time, there are quite a few other tendencies, such as the Antifa and the extreme left, uh, coming down to the streets, facing off against the extreme right fundamentalists. Yes. Uh, now, one other component he uh, ignores, I might add, is the large middle class, mainly in booming sectors such as tech and AI, who are largely invested in the economy rather than politics. And for yes. them, what actually matters is how best they can push their business rather than be engaged in this populist talk. And uh, th this does not really um, take away from the fact that there is a wealth divide which is growing and the divide among the racial groups within the US, which is also growing. But we need to also underline those who are heavily invested in these booming sectors like the Asian Americans are actually gaining versus those who are a little too occupied with political talk, like the Caucasian group, if I may add on a lighter note. Uh, Paul, your take on uh, on the populist tendencies, because it doesn't really uh, be doing any favors to either of the camps either ways. Well, look, it's interesting. I mean... Dalio talks about effective leaders in civil wars are inspirational figures. I mean, as much as you know, fundamentally I'm a conservative, except when it's failing you. And I think conservatism in the Western world is is failing. Um, Australia's seen a change out of a conservative government because of their failures. Biden's uh, elitist Democrats are failing. Um, you know, if you look at how Italy swung under Mussolini um, and compare him to Trump, I can't see a nation getting behind Trump like they did with Mussolini. So Delia doesn't think his points um, ride through. But I think that popularist issue is another way to put it. If you continue to fail the people, if you continue to look after political elites, if you continue to practice nepotism with the business world for power, ultimately you become unpopular. So... 
in relative terms, people call that populism as opposed to what they should call it is, is failure by those in power, i.e. poor leadership. So I think we are going to uh, see a continuing um, rise of, of, of populist politicians. The problem with a lot of the Western world is they're not focused on policy of the people. They're not focused on being really clear that we represent A, B, C, D, E. This is why it's good for the nation. It's we represent A, B, C because it's good for us to try and get to or to cling on to power. If you look at the rise of of the ex, um, you know, the the, the Brexit guy um, in, in the UK, what's his name again? Um, Farage, right? Yes. You know, he's now got a political party and he's shaking... Um, the tree and the pigeons are flying out because what Farage is focusing on is policies, right? He's focusing on things that are important to the British community that both parties are failing to do. So, you know, I can't remember how many prime ministerial changes they've had in Britain, uh, but even the existing um, prime ministers worked out that they don't have the popular vote, they're no longer respected by the electorate, so they need to try and get back into power. What he wasn't. Uh, really focused on is if you use skullduggery to you know seize bank accounts on a guy with the profile of Farage, he doesn't really like Trump. Probably doesn't want to be in politics, but you know right or wrong believes he can actually create a positive change. I think in Farage, as opposed to Trump, Farage actually does care about the British people and wants to a change, affect change for the nation. I think in Trump's case, it's more about personal benefit and ego. And there is probably a misguided element that he's doing it for some kind of uh, nationalistic motives. I, I, I think that's probably not true, though. Well, uh, would you like to comment on the populist take? Apparently, the American states and cities such as San Francisco, Seattle, uh, they seem to be victims of this left-wing populist uh, brand of governance, which basically takes away any form of assertive governance in terms of <laughs> law enforcement and uh, yeah. we see we see corners of central cities or cent uh, center of the cities like seattle being abandoned and uh, police have practically uh, resigned uh, to such an extent that uh, all of these areas are ruled by the drug addicts and and we see this out in the open it's no secret uh, oh look at Pagav, yeah look i mean one of the real purges that's going to affect the Western world is, is this this wokeism, okay? And it's it's lovely to watch. If you get a chance, I think, in fact, let's formalise that. Look at the Prime Minister's speech on wokeism and how they deal with it and how they think about it. And what you're seeing in that interview is a very eloquent piece of very intelligent thought that isn't controlled by the Western media and, and, and various factions that have got their own agendas whilst pretending to change the world for the better. And one of the extensions of wokeism is the military loses power. The military leadership has to be um, submissive to the politicians. The politicians aren't running for the people, they're running for themselves. And you discredit the work your police force is doing and done. And not to say that some of the some of the state police forces in America have done some bad things, but that you can't, you know, hold your whole police force responsible for that. You've got to tidy up the messy bits. And I think we're going to ultimately see you know, the pendulum will have to swing back because when you don't have a police force and issues take over, you, you go back to the days when you know, Chicago was burning and then they decided to get the um, Italian Heritage Mafias under control. So uh, I, I think it's an extension of wokeism. I think it's an extension of people want to sound nice. I think too many people are focused on politics and not doing stuff. And I think Frankly, mate, I think the tech sector is probably overrated and it's part in the middle class. If you look at what the middle class work in, actually the tech sector, and even if you combine it with the banking sector, is a fairly small sector compared to America. And America is now pushing down a pathway where we're the greatest capitalism country. We believe in free markets. But if China produces stuff cheaper than us, we say it's a security threat, hacker the the the, the infrastructure for internet so let's ban them for that if they produce electronic cars cheaper than us then we whack tariffs on them because we don't actually acknowledge capitalism and efficiency if it's cheaper we we pull out a discrimination car but dress it up as some kind of mystical tariff it's unfair because they're winning well isn't that what capitalism is all about winning through efficiency winning through cost reduction
So there are a lot of issues here that Dalio doesn't cover off that are extremely relevant, okay? Yes, I must agree, Paul. In fact, uh, the the weakness on part of, or at least the perceived weakness on part of law enforcement and the civil unrest playing out on the streets will not really help this narrative. It will only further the narrative of so-called civil war in the horizon, however Wasn't unrealistic it? that is. And Bhargav, it's easy to criticise the behaviours of army and military and special forces when you never have to go. It's easy to say, I could do that too until you have to do it. And it's easy to criticise a police force until you don't have one. So I think America's in for a world of hurt. Um, and I don't think it really matters whether they vote left or vote right. It is too polarised is the main point. There isn't free thought. There isn't a government that's governing for the country. So I think... Um, yeah, we're going to see some interesting times leading up to the November election and afterwards, but certainly not civil war. Certainly. Well, Paul, thank you for your time. Uh, I do appreciate your inputs. Braga, any final thoughts? No, I'd just like to concur with uh, everything that Paul and you have talked today. I do agree that as much as, you know, Reid Alio is a credible person with a very strong background in the financial sector, I do think that civil war may be a bit uh, of a far-fetched um, potential scenario because civil un civil war and civil unrest are quite different. And perhaps we'll see some Antifa versus right-wing uh, radicals on the streets. But the US is a police state after all, so I don't quite foresee it going that far. Thank you, Raga. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Bhagav. Thanks, Raga. See you.